um, being healthy versus then on sick care. And more and more people are, are putting their own health care dollars in their own hands, hands and choosing what to do with them. So some of the tips today hopefully will help you kind of decide on how you should spend that money and how you sh we should help you and, and you can help yourself to managing your own heart health as well as your own general, general health and longevity. So the first tip that I'm going to give you is that we need to eat for our health. In fact, Dr. Bob Kahn, who was a mentor and a just world-renowned cardiologist that I work with at Cardiovascular Consultants here in Kansas City, and it's really interesting. For years, he would tell me, he said, Becky, if patients would eat for health, they would develop a healthy taste. And that's really why we're supposed to eat. We're supposed to eat to feed our organs, and we're supposed to eat to feed our bones. Um, so our bones, our organs need food to get energy and to survive and be maintained over the years. What we've tended to do is eat foods for pleasure. And so we don't give our organs, our body, our brain, and even the bones the nutrients, vitamins, minerals that they need. And we're trying to survive on draining our energy instead of giving our, our bones and organs energy. We're draining our energy, and we're even draining um, how healthy our bones are. It's interesting, too, is that over the years, whenever we look at diet fads, it all goes back to, because if you read all the diet books out there, it truly, what they all agree on is getting rid of carbs and sugars, simple carbs and sugars, cookie cakes, pies, chips, getting rid of the simple carbs and sugars, and mm -hmm. um, processed foods. What is healthy is eating, quote, real foods, eating foods that do not have labels, lean proteins and fruits and vegetables. And that's what our organs need. That's what our bones need. Um, if you look at a label and you need a chemistry, chemistry degree to actually read what's in the food, you basically should put it down very carefully and walk away quickly because that's not what our body is genetically designed to consume. And the large portion of our health, our heart health, our longevity, and our overall health is based upon what we eat. And we need to be really conscientious about are we eating to feed our body or are we eating for pleasure. Um, more and more there's been con concentration on what foods have calcium in and how do we get calcium in our diet. And I think it's really important because for years we would tell people to take more and more calcium supplements. But we know that our body cannot absorb all the, all the calcium in a supplement. In fact, that's why they've split up the pills where you're only going to take 500 milligrams twice a day or three times a day. But recently we have learned from you know, some, some recent studies that in women that took the calcium supplements, they had more hard calcified plaque in their heart arteries. So our body cannot absorb the calcium in these supplements. And when you look about how we naturally got um, calcium in our diets, how our ancestors naturally got their calcium, they basically got it from nibbling and eating on bones. And so one of the things, like Dr. O'Keefe will say, that you know, to you know, eat the sardine bones. You know, he'll eat the bones out of the sardines, but many of us are not going to go around eating bones to get our calcium. Um, and so it's interesting, because I've come from a family of osteoporosis and poor bone health, and so I do everything, exercise, weight-bearing exercises, and I'm really excited because CardioTabs will be coming out with an alternative for, to calcium supplements, which will be ground up bones kind of in a powder form in a capsule so that when you swallow it, your body will digest it and then slowly get from that bone the calcium that it needs, and that's the natural way our ancestors did and how we're genetically designed to do it. I also try to get about 500 to 600 milligrams of calcium through diet. And foods that contain calcium, you know, you got spinach and kale and almonds and sardines. There's unsweetened almond milk and there's skim milk. You've um, got to be careful with the sugar on skim milk, but um, all those are high in calcium. So we need to eat foods. We need to eat real food. We should have a lean protein in at least two colors, fruits and vegetables for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and for snacks. We need to eat for our health. And also make sure when we're eating those lean proteins and fruits and vegetables that we're getting foods that have calcium in it. So we can get at least 500 to 600 milligrams of the calcium through diet. That would be the number one tip um, for your heart health and for your longevity. Number two is to always eat breakfast. Um, after you fast all night, your body really needs a metabolic jump start for the day. And so you need a really good, healthy breakfast. It's also going to kind of set your pace for what you're going to 
feel it later on. If you start your day with sugar for breakfast, every couple hours you're going to be craving sugar. If you start your day with Pop-Tarts and cereal, um, in a couple hours you're not going to be able to solve a complex problem or have a high productivity time because you're going to be needing more carbs and sugars, whether you're sipping on coffee with sugar in it or you have a peppermint or some gum, you're always going to be looking for sugar. So we really need to make sure that we get a healthy breakfast because that's going to actually set the tone for the rest of the day. And again, for breakfast, lean protein and fruits and vegetables. If you want the non-fat plain Greek yogurt and add your own berries and fruit to it, that's a healthy breakfast. You can do a handful of healthy nuts with fruit and vegetables. You can do leftover you know, meat from the night before. You can do eggs. Limit your yolks to no more than three or four a week. Your egg whites, your protein. But again, you want to not, you want to have lean protein and fruits and vegetables and you do not want to skip your breakfast. That's one of the most important meals of the day. It also gives your brain a boost and it fuels your productivity and your creativity for the day. So breakfast says a lot about how you're going to do and work and fill for the, the rest of the day. So make sure you give yourself a really healthy breakfast in the morning because a lot depends on um, how your day is based upon your breakfast. The third thing that I think we've taken for granted over the years is basically we should grow garden because that does a lot more for us um, than one can even imagine. I mean, first of all, there's no better way to teach principles of healthy eating than to grow your own garden. Nothing that you buy in a grocery store or even that you get from a farmer's market will compare to the nutrients from the foods that you get just a few feet away from your kitchen, the foods that you pick just a few feet away from your kitchen. And in fact, when you pick them, you should use them immediately for cooking or you should just go ahead and eat it raw. That's going to be some of your healthiest foods. You're going to get the most nutrients out of that. It's interesting. Um, Sometimes, like the frozen fruit, the no added sugar frozen fruit, is often um, healthier and have more nutrients in it than those that are freshly picked because when they're freshly picked, they're often picked before they ripen. So during travel time, they ripen by the time they hit the store, whereas they'll pick them right at ripe time and they put them in and freeze them uh, on the fresh fruit. So, you're not going to meet, miss any nutrients if you grow it outside your kitchen and you eat it and consume it immediately after you uh, pick it. That's going to be some of the healthiest foods. Some of the foods that you can grow, onions, peppers, cucumber, tomatoes, green beans, lettuce, corn. Um, and another thing, too, is that you can do like a community garden or you and your neighbor can each have a garden and share. You split up who's going to have what and then you kind of share the fruits and vegetables um, that you have. I can remember as a kid, we always had a garden. We also had an apple tree in our yard, and our neighbor had a cherry tree, and we all switched over who was going to pick apples, who was going to pick cherries, and um, we all shared the fruits and, and the vegetables from the garden. Um, and I think that's really important. A lot of people think you need a full acre or, or a huge amount of land, and you don't. It only needs a small area. So I think it's really important that we teach our kids and, and we, we start growing our own garden. And also is exercise get you out in nature, um, and you're nourishing, you're nourishing a plant. So um, it's healthy every way you look at it. Um, so it's fitting that the first three so far have to do with the foods we eat and how we get the foods we eat. Tip number four is also going to be about the foods we eat, um, and it's going to be to eat fish. You know, if you don't like fish or you can't take fish, or don't like the taste of fish, um, you can take a fish oil supplement. But it is recommended to be healthy to have about two to three servings of fish per week. And you want the fish, um, you know, that are high, you want the fish that are high in omega-3s, healthy fats. That's going to be like salmon, sardines, tuna, herring, mackerel, swordfish, all those have high, good um, omega-3 fats. So they're high in good fats and they're low in the unhealthy saturated fats. Um, fish is often high in vitamin C as well as selenium and, and obviously high in protein. Um, and fish oil or omega-3s, they're actually really good not only just for the heart but also for the blood vessels. And they protect us against um, the development of a fatal arrhythmia. Um, they improve our blood vessel function and at higher dosages um, 
they lower triglycerides, which are a bad cholesterol. Uh, so it's really important that we get omega-3 uh, fats in our diet. And if you don't like um, eating fish, you can always take omega-3 supplements. I, I always, everybody asks me what supplements do I use and why, and so and a lot of times people ask me the difference in the omega-3s from the CardioTab fish oil line. So we have the three different omega-3s here, and I'll be happy to discuss these with you. The um, first is the original project, product of the omega-3s from CardioTabs, and it's an enteric coated capsule, and it's a little bit smaller capsule, and it's easier for people to swallow. Um, the American Heart Association will recommend that on any bottle of fish oil that you look at the DHA and EPA, you add those up. And if you um, just don't have heart disease, but you just want opt optimal health, it would recommend 500 milligrams of the DHA and EPA combined. If you have heart disease, it will want 1,000 milligrams of DHA and EPA combined. So what I put on here is this is what's in three capsules of the original omega-3 fish oil. So in the, it's, they're smaller capsules. You need to take three, and you'll get um, about 975 milligrams of the DHA and EPA. The extra strength is a little bit bigger capsule. It also has some vitamin D3 in it, which is healthy. It's healthy to help absorb your calcium. Um, and vitamin D3 is on every receptor. It has a receptor on every cell in our body. So we really need our vitamin D. And if we live above the 37th um, parallel, like it's so it's Atlanta or above Atlanta, or above Los Angeles, but kind of above that line. Basically, from November to March, even if the sun's out, the rays is not strong enough for us to produce to hit our skin and for us to produce our own vitamin D. So we often need a supplement um, in the winter months. And so in the extra strength in two capsules, you're going to get 1,100 or 1,200 milligrams of the um, DHA and EPA and 600 milligrams of the vitamin D3, and that's in two capsules, but they're a little bit bigger capsules. I have some patients that can't swallow the capsules, don't want to swallow the capsules, or if they have high triglycerides, you need higher dosages. So someone that has high triglycerides, you want to have 2,000 to 4,000 milligrams of this DHA and EPA. Um, and so oftentimes people will do the liquid fish oil. CardiTabs has done a great job. They've tried different flavors often off and on, um, this newest flavor is the best that they've had yet, and, it, and you really can't taste any of the fish on it. It doesn't even have near that oil taste as um, some of the products that you get over the counter have had. Um, so this is a really light and healthy um, omega-3 fish oil if you don't like the pills or if you have high triglycerides, it's only one teaspoon a day, and you get 1,000 IUs of the vitamin D3. So you'll get tw about 2,200, 20. 100 milligrams of the DHA, and you'll get 1,000 IUs of the vitamin D3 in one teaspoon if you do the liquid. Um, this is good for kids, like a half a teaspoon a couple times a week um, for them as well. So that, those are some options. And those are the difference in the omega-3s from CardioTab. A lot of people always ask me that. Next, I have a slide that is, um, I've, I've kept um, from a patient that had high triglycerides. And this is the blood tube. And you can see that the blood starts here and it goes all the way to the top and what has settled are the carbs and sugars that are in the blood on top here. Um, here the tube starts in the middle, the white at the very end is the tube, but you can see where the blood starts and it goes all the way to the top. That's the patient's blood and you can see we're pushing a bunch of carbs and sugars through the artery wall. And then here's the blood tube from here to here with the carbs and sugars um, rising to the top. So this person's blood is craving fruits and vegetables and antioxidants and just clean living. It's had way too many breads, pastas, rice, crackers, cookies, cakes, sodas. It just can't keep up. And so we're pushing this sludge through the artery wall. Um, high dose fish oils will help lower triglycerides. Exercise will help lower that. And eating healthy, lean proteins and fruits and vegetables and getting rid of the processed foods and the extra um, carbs and sugars. So a lot of people don't realize when we talk about eating healthy and having lean proteins and fruits and vegetables, you know, why, why are we actually doing that? Well, this is somebody that doesn't eat healthy, and you can see what we're pushing, what's being pushed through the artery wall. And we're thinking about big arteries in our heart, but think about our smaller arteries in our brain. So some of the things that we teach you today is also going to help prevent dementia as, as well as, so it's going to be good for brain health as well as heart health. So it's all going to be about lean protein, fruits and vegetables, getting two or three servings of fish a week, if not taking your omega-3 supplements every day. And the fifth, 
The fifth um, tip for heart health and longevity is to be active. I always tell my patients if I had a pill that told you, and I told you it would help you prevent diabetes, it would help you lower your bad cholesterol, raise your good cholesterol. If I had a pill that would help you lower your blood pressure, reduce your risk for clots, increase your body's sensitivity to your own insulin, and would cause some anti-aging for you, so you wouldn't age as quickly. A lot of people would say, I don't care what it is, just give it to me. I don't care what formulary it's on, just give it to me. We all have access to it. It's exercise. And so I'll talk a little bit about exercise. Um, one of the questions that was received before the presentation was, Becky, what's the best exercise? And this is what I tell all my patients, because I don't know who, where this person's coming from. So if you don't exercise at all, I, I always tell people I want you to walk 10 minutes a day for the purpose of exercise. So if you don't typically exercise, I want you to go for a walk for the purpose of exercise for at least 10 minutes, because that starts getting you into an exercise routine. Um, a lot of patients will say, oh, I get 10 minutes of walking in during the day already. I want you to do an additional to what you're currently doing for the purpose of exercise. Go for a 10-minute walk or get on your treadmill for 10 minutes or the elliptical or the cycle. Do it for 10 minutes. If you do more than that, that's great. But I want to start getting you making it a priority and putting 10 minutes down every day for exercise. Now, if you're already doing exercise, and oftentimes I'll have patients that say, I walk 30 minutes every day. I've done so for years. Or... I have a bicycle at home and I cycle for 20 minutes and I lift weights. That's all great, but I want to do some intensity intervals in there. So if you're walking for 30 minutes, I want you to walk your brisk pace for about five or six minutes. And then I want you to go 30 seconds to a minute as fast as you can without jogging, then go back to your brisk pace, and then do the intervals again um, during the whole time that you're, you're walking. Or if you're bicycling or on a stationary bike, um, five or six minutes at your brisk pace, then 20 seconds as hard and fast as you can, then go back for five or six minutes at your brisk pace, and can just continue to alternate that, because that helps to get some fitness in. So that good cardio, and I think three or four times a week, it's also really good to do weight-bearing exercises, so do some light weight toning. And if you're a swimmer, you definitely need to make sure you get some weight lifting in, uh, because we want to tell your bones that you know it's good for bone health, and we want to tell them you need calcium, you need these things in your bones and vitamins and minerals so they absorb them. A lot of uh, people that don't do weight-bearing exercises, such as swimming, will get osteoporosis, osteopenia. Um, so definitely, if you're a swimmer, you'll want to make sure you, you get in some weight-bearing and weight-lifting exercises and some toning. Um, but for everybody, we should begin getting in cardio every day, and then we should also do three or four times a week of some toning. It's really important because we've kind of totally changed um, how we go about our days. In fact, we really aren't wearing out anymore. We're resting out. And um, there, there was a slide that I had seen before that said, before you begin a program of sedentary living and isolation from the natural world, see your health care provider because you're about to embark on one of the most dangerous lifestyles. And that is so true. I mean, this person is needing antioxidants, fruits and vegetables to give them energy, needs a little weight loss, and needs some exercise. So we're often living about how can we be the, take the worst care of ourselves and be yet the most productive, and it just doesn't, um, it just doesn't work. So number five is to be as active as possible, and tip number six would be to achieve and maintain your ideal weight. So when you achieve and you maintain your ideal weight, you reduce your risk of diabetes. You reduce the strain on your joints and muscles because the extra pressure that's placed on your joint will, will eventually and can lead to osteoarthritis. So if we want to prevent osteoarthritis in our life, um, we need to actually achieve and maintain an ideal weight. Um, more weight is harder. The heart has to work harder and it's less efficient. Um, if you achieve your ideal weight, your heart won't have to work as hard, and it'll lower your blood pressure. Also, if you achieve your ideal weight, it'll reduce your risk for some cancers. Um, so some of the cancers that it reduces, cervical, breast, colon, ovarian, um, are some of the cancers that we reduce by achieving your own, your healthy, your own healthy weight. 
Um, have it, being overweight is also a burden. So it's not just the physiological changes that, are, that occur, but there's emotional um, burden that goes with being overweight. And your quality of life is down. So the only thing that's standing between you and, and being a healthy weight is, you, is your mind. You know, once you get your mind focused on, I can have lean proteins, fruits and vegetables, I can walk 10 minutes a day, or I can increase my exercise, those two things together are going to help you maintain your weight loss, and it's just staying focused or get to your ideal weight, and it's maintaining focus on that. A lot of people say, Becky, what is my ideal weight? Um, many places go by a body mass index. Um, body mass index is the taller you are or the shorter you are or the stockier you are, the, le the less accurate it is. But what is accurate is that if you take your height and then you met, if, you, if your height is 70 inches tall, let's say, and then you measured your waist circumference. The waist circumference is the top of your hip bone. Go, through, go around both the top of the hip bones. And if you can't find your hip bone, if you lean to the right and left, you will be able to fill the hip bones. And then you go all the way around, and you go across the middle section as to what goes through the door first. That's the part you want to go around. And your waist circumference should be half your height in inches. So if you are 70 inches tall, the waist circumference should be 35 inches or less. Because when we have all this weight that is around our organ, it actually works against us. In fact, these are all the things that it secretes. We think that it's, that it's just a storage depot, but it's not. It's highly active. Those fat cells around our organs are highly active. In fact, all the stuff on the right side, basically angiotensinogen raises blood pressure, um, increase of free fatty acids and insulin and, um, the, and the plasminogen activator inhibitor all leads to clotting and diabetes. Everything on this side is inflammation leads to, on the left side, this inflammation leads to asthma, arthritis, and type 2 diabetes and inflammation. And these are the organs that it affects. When we have the fat that's around our organs, around our waist, it can affect our lungs. We can have sleep apnea. In fact, a lot of many people, you, you can tell if they can't sit in a meeting without falling asleep, um, that there's issues. They um, snore at night, asthma. It can affect your liver. You can have a non-alcoholic fatty liver. In fact, um, one of the top reasons for needing a liver transplant is because of a non-alcoholic fatty liver. We take in too many carbs and sugars, and our liver cannot process it fast enough. And so then we have inflammation of the liver. When that inflammation turns to scar tissue, we don't get that part back of the liver. Um, so again, when we have the fat around our abdomen, it can affect all these organs, our skin. It can cause infertility, polycystic ovary disease. Um, it can cause pancreatitis, some cancers, and affect our brain and our eyes. So we want to make sure that we actually reduce the amount of fat that's around our organs. This is about a 100-pound difference in the two individuals. And you can see how all the fat is around the organ. This is highly dangerous, and it is not healthy. It's lethal fat that works against you. Um, we actually recently have, in, in our cardio wellness center, has, have gotten a body composition assessment test. Because um, one of the things that our center does really good at is a lot of places you'll go is you will go and get get your risk factors treated. So you'll get your cholesterol treated, your blood pressure treated, your diabetes treated, but the disease is completely missed. And so that's one of the things that we do really well is we screen for heart disease, but we also screen for, you know, how severe are your risks, how severe is the heart disease, because it tells us how severe we need to treat, that we need, would need to treat your risk. This is an example of a body composition assessment, because believe me, there's thin people that don't eat healthy, and they have tons of fat that's around their, their organs. It's called visceral fat. That's the lethal fat. And um, so for $50, you can find out your overall percent of body fat. But what's really important is how much fat is around the organs. What, how much visceral fat, lethal fat, is around your organs. And so it's 50 bucks for the test. Um, and it, it is quite motivating to see if you're going to lose weight where you start and where, where you end up. But that's the, the lethal fat is the visceral fat. So we want to make sure our waist circumference is half our height in inches. That gets us to our, our, ideal, our ideal body weight. And when we get to our ideal body weight, we reduce our risk for all kinds of chronic diseases, inflammation, aches and pains, and cancers. So our tip number six is to get into, to achieve your ideal body weight. And tip number seven, when we're talking about heart health, 
we need to do all these other all these things that I've talked about. But we also need to know what our cholesterol numbers are. And not just know what our, your cholesterol numbers are, because if you get your cholesterol under control, it will help to reduce your risk for heart disease and, and heart events. That's part of it. Um, but also, it's important to ask your healthcare providers about statin medicines, because statins like Lipitor or Crestor or Pravacol or Simvastatin, um, these, these medications not only just reduce cholesterol, but if you take the reduction of cholesterol away, it lowers, it changes the whole body's environment because it lowers inflammation throughout your body. And there's been so many discoveries linking chronic diseases with inflammation, such as Alzheimer's, cancers, autoimmune diseases, diabetes. So taking a statin will help to reduce inflammation all throughout your body. A lot of people don't want to take a statin medication or, or prescription medicine. And if you'd like to get some natural benefit um, of a statin medication through an over-the-counter supplement, um, there's, there's red yeast rice, which is like a natural form of a statin. Um, and I often use it. A lot of people say, well, what's your supplements? What do you use for, sup for cholesterol lowering or to get your, your, um, some protection? I always use the red yeast rice. Um, you got to be careful on which brands to buy on that. You want one that's made in the USA. Some of them have citron in, in it, which is very um, hard on your kidneys and uh, can be detrimental to your kidneys. So we don't want one with citron in it. So make sure when you look at that that you get one made in the USA and one that doesn't have. I always use the Cardiotab um, red yeast rice because um, it's regulated, and I know. It's, um, that it is regulated. Dr. O'Keefe and uh, the Cardiotab team did a great job and have a third-party lab that reviews all their products. Um, so it will also help you with cholesterol lowering, and it will give you some of that um, natural statin benefit. And the Cardio-T is the uh, next biggest product I use that helps to lower cholesterol. Um, it'll, I see in my patients that anywhere from a 10 to 15 percent reduction with the Cardio-T um, is usually what we get. It also helps to get rid of some belly fat, and it maintains a healthy immune system. So these are things that I do for cholesterol, for supplements. Um, but again, you need to know your cholesterol numbers, and not just know today's cholesterol numbers, but compare it to your prior cholesterol numbers. Where were you six months, four months ago? Um, where were you in the winter compared to the summer? Where were you when you were exercising and not exercising? Because there's a range that each of your numbers can be. Are you at the top end of the range, the low end of the range? And hold yourself accountable to, I'm going to make these numbers better. Number eight is to automate ourselves. And this is one that I actually have been working on, is the best ways for us to reduce stress um, in our bodies is to provide a balance in our bodies. Our bodies need that balance. And therefore, we need to maintain a regular and consistent routine on a daily basis, at least to the best of our ability, regardless of weekends or holidays or social demands or late night outs or, or going to the office or special occasions, to the best of our ability, we need to provide regular and consistent routine. Uh, routine. Our body loves predictability. In fact, if we were to go without eating, like if you were, if you didn't eat at the same time every day and or you were eating at the same time every day and then you went um, three or four hours longer, your body would start to release cortisol, which increases sugars. It would start to think, oh my gosh, you're not going to feed me right now. And it would start to um, deviate from the norm and make things that work against us because it thinks it's not going to get its food like it normally does. So we really should get up about the same time every day. We should eat and exercise around the same time every day um, because that is what our body thrives on. And I put a picture of this dog here because dogs are so routine. In fact, I will tell you, I, I, did, I got smarter on the second dog, but my first dog I had as an adult, I would walk her every day at 5 a.m. before I went to work, and I did that for years. It was interesting, however, is she didn't care if it was Saturday or Sunday. She woke me up at 5 a.m. to go for a walk, and it got to be old. Um, and I often would get up and go and walk her because she was so demanding and come back and go, to, go back to sleep. Um, so on this next dog, I didn't start the 5 a.m. routine because I didn't want to carry it out on Saturdays and Sundays. But dogs are so routine. Their body likes routine. They want to eat around the same time. They want to 
um, exercise about the same amount of time and the same time of day, and if you have a dog, they'll help keep you in routine, and, and they'll make you want to do things that, um, that keep you in a routine. So think of ways how you can automate your life, how much days when you can always get in the exercise, when you can always have a healthy meal, when you can um, get up each morning, go to bed at night, because your body thrives on predictability. And then number nine is to stop smoking. And this does more than just heart health. It, it reduces risk for heart, but it also, you know, if you stop smoking, um, it'll also reduce risk for other diseases. Um, smoking is definitely a deal breaker on your health. If you smoke, you're going to have a high risk for heart disease, a high risk for cancer. You're going to have um, cholesterol that's abnormal. It's going to damage your arteries. It's going to damage the lungs. It'll raise your heart rate. It'll raise your blood pressure which that leads to other, other issues. So if you, if you are smoking, the best thing you can do in the most preventive lifestyle, the most powerful preventive lifestyle modification you can make would be to stop smoking. There's several um, options out there. When people are, are quitting smoking, usually we'll tell people to do like a pat, the patch for like maybe like a maintenance dose of the nicotine. And then as you have surges, maybe you do an inhaler or an e-cigarette or there's some other options out there. But Ask your health care provider. Um, we also have a smoking sensation class that we offer about three or four times a year. The next one's on April 7th. It's got a 66% sustainability rate. We have a health coach named Janice that puts this on, and it's five sessions. So if you smoke, you know someone that smokes, um, please tell them about the smoking sensation program. It's one of the best things that we've had. It's helped a lot of people to optimize their health. Um, again, smoking is a deal breaker. so. Uh, number nine tip would be to stop smoking. The last tip would be to manage chronic conditions. So if you do have a chronic condition, if you did get heart disease, if you, um, if you did have high cholesterol or if you did get diabetes, it's really important um, that you manage it, that you don't give up. In fact, you step up and you get with a health care provider that you trust and you start developing long-term strategies and you start having it assessed more frequently so you can manage it better and you know what things alter it or help it or make it worse. So don't wait till things get worse. Start to manage it and follow in a program that gives you some long-term management. In fact, um, our Cardio Wellness Center, we have a three-step program and we make it really simple. Um, the first step is we do assessments. We look at all your risk, potential, and existing. And we ask a bunch of questions, family history, diet, nutrition, as well as do blood tests, look for sleep apnea. And then you sit down with one of the nurse practitioners, myself or another nurse practitioner here, Shirley, and we develop a plan that's specific to you. If you travel a lot, what kind of foods can you get when you're out? If you're not traveling a lot but you're quick or you have seven kids, we try to make a plan that, to your specific situation and how it can help you. And the third, which is the most important, and a lot of people don't realize how important this is, is that when you leave our office, you'll have a follow-up appointment within about three or four months. And then we can see, it'll take 20 minutes, and we'll, we'll redo your cholesterol profile, your blood pressures, your heart rate, your weight, your sugars, and we'll look at that and we'll say, we'll compare to where you were last time to where you are this time. And we'll tweak what worked, what didn't work. And again, we base this upon how, how severe your risks are, how severe your heart disease are, and that's how we adjust. Um, so get manage your chronic condition. Don't let it go. Find somebody in your area that can help you manage it. Um, get your get your blood tests and, and your um, evaluation of it more frequently, so you can start to have better control of things. And then I'm going to give you a, so these were the top ten tips for the heart health and longevity: were to eat for your health, eat breakfast, grow a garden, eat fish two or three times a week, be active achieve and maintain your ideal weight, know your cholesterol numbers, automate your life. If you're smoking, stop smoking, and jump in and manage your chronic conditions and don't let it get away. And I'm just going to leave on a couple of bonuses for you because I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you two tips on how you can complete those top ten tips that make it easy. The first one is to get a dog because as I told you, dogs like to exercise. They give you some downtime. They get you connected with nature because you're out in your community. You're walking them. You're doing things with them. And they also like routine. And that's my dog, Bailey, over here on the right. And she's telling me whenever she wants to go for a walk, you can see that she's ready to go. 
The other thing, this is more of a 21st century, and I have just myself gotten into this, but um, get a tracking app. And it's been one of the best things. Dr. O'Keefe actually got me onto this, um, where you measure things. And you can measure, you can find a tracking app that measures what you need to have measured. You can measure your steps that you take every day. You can measure how many minutes of the day that you're active. You can get a device that will measure your blood pressure. If you're having blood pressure issues, you can measure your sleep habits. And this is just a device. This is called the Fitbit over here, and I have a better picture of it. Um, this is just what it measured yesterday for me. So this tells me how many steps I took. So I did over 10,000 steps, so it turned green. Um, I did over five miles, so it turned green. Um, I did over 30 active minutes, so it turned green. I did over 10 floors, because that's what's set. And it also showed my sleep. But I, not big enough here, but it also shows my sleep when I'm working on my sleep. I'm trying to get more of a seven to nine hours of sleep. So think of ways that you can track yourself, because if you don't track it, you don't know. And you say, oh, I got that in yesterday, or I got that in last week. How many times last week did you get that in, and did, did we cheat ourselves? Because um, this is your health. So buy it, get it by, or, or even like pedometer. You can get a pedometer at Walmart. Things like that will help with, tra with um, different um, ways to track. I have some questions here I'll go over with you. Um, CardioTab is giving 15% off all CardioTab orders for day, today if you use the heart or the health, healthy heart 15 code. And I'll leave that up. And why that's up, I'll go over some of the questions that have come in. Um, is that okay, Aaron? Yep, that's perfect. Okay. Um, so what CardioScan score levels are considered light? moderate and high risk. And another one says what ranges are minimal, moderate, and high risk. So these scores are based upon you being male or female and based upon your age. All right? Um, I don't necessarily go by that. What I go by is what is your score. If your score is over 100, typically I'll order a stress test. Because the cardio scan just picks up hard plaque. It doesn't pick up soft plaque. And it doesn't tell if it's if the plaque, whether it's hard or soft, it doesn't tell if it's blocking blood flow to the heart. So if your score is over 100, typically I will do a stress test. Now, that's just a rough guideline. If you have a score of 90, and because the cardio scan also tells you how many lesions you have or how many plaques, plaques you have. If you had one lesion and it gave you a score of 90, I would still order a stress test. If you had four lesions that gave you a score of 90, I might not necessarily order a stress test. That's just kind of a guideline. Um, anybody with like a strong family history of heart disease, so if you have a strong family history of heart disease, um, I might even go ahead and do maybe a stress echo and, and make sure that we're not missing anything, that you don't have soft plaque. And we can't. And you also got to go by your symptoms. Are you having symptoms? And we got to put that all together. It's all part of the, the puzzle. Um, another question that we have is, how common is it for someone to feel fluttering in their chest? Is it dangerous? And I have a rapid heartbeat off and on. Well, it's hard to tell because I don't know what the rapid heartbeat, heartbeat is. Some are dangerous, some are not. Um, they have devices. I would, I would talk to your health care provider. And, you know, I would, first of all, at, before you went, I make the appointment that while you're waiting to see the health care provider, I would make a little diary when it happens. Um, how often it happens, how long it lasts, if you were short of breath or, or had any chest pain with it. And if you're any of those things, I would go to the emergency room when it, when it would happen. But um, if you don't have those things, I'd kind of make notes and, and bring that into the provider. Um, and then you can do wear a halter monitor for 24 hours or 48 hours to see if your heart's going in and out of um, arrhythmias and what the arrhythmia is. But they also have devices that, like, when you're having an arrhythmia, you get, like, a credit card, you could just put it on your chest and it will submit what the rhythm is. So I definitely would talk it over with your health care provider. If you're having shortness of breath or chest pain with it or lightheaded or dizzy, I would definitely um, you know, call 911 during that episode. Um, if you've had that and you're not having the episode now, I'd follow with your health care provider for sure, find out what's going on. Um, so what is the recommended daily protein requirement for a male just over 70? I'm not really one to, to count. I mean, the minute we start kind of micromanaging our diet, we count carbs and sugars and proteins. Um, eventually, we lose sight of what we're what we're eating, and and that, that all goes away. Um, 
If you eat lean protein and fruits and vegetables for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're going to be fine. The rule of thumb, however, is you want about 21 to 30 grams per meal, about three times a day. Um, or you can do like one half to one milligram per pound of body weight on the protein. And that depends on how active you are. If you're really active, I would do the one milligram per pound of body weight on the protein. And again, you know, really, you don't have to count calories or anything if you eat foods that don't have labels, really. If you do lean proteins and fruits and vegetables, you shop the parameter of the grocery store and not the inside, you're going to be, for the most part, fine. Um, so please discuss low salt, low fat versus no salt, no fat. Um, let's, I'll go over the low fat, no fat. Um, when you get things that say low fat, you're going to get foods that have more carbohydrates and more sugars in them. Um, and you don't want low fat or no fat. You want good fat. So um, good fats are omega-3 fats, fats that you get in fish and some, some nuts. And so you want more healthy fats than bad fats. So it's more about getting less saturated fat and more omega-3 fats, monounsaturated fats, other forms of fat. So um, you have a low saturated fat meal, usually when you're about less than 2.5 grams per meal of saturated fat or less. That's usually a low saturated fat meal. And that's good. Saturated fat's terrible for you. But you still need to have fat in that meal. So make it healthy fat, um, whether you, you know, put fish with it, uh, have nuts with it. So get good omega-3 fats in your diet. Or monounsaturated fats, you know, avocados and your lean proteins are going to have low saturated fat, um, low saturated fats and, and higher proteins and calciums and, and other fats that you need. So, I think that's kind of a misconception that the world thinks we need to have no fat or low fat. Uh, low saturated fat, yes, but we need healthy fats. And we need a moderate amount of fats, but we need it to be healthy. On the low salt, no salt, um, the deal with salt and sodium, if you are eating out three times a day, you're probably getting tons of sodium. When you eat out, it's loaded with sodium. If you get foods with no added salt, you're going to be good. And again, if you eat foods without labels, lean proteins and fruits and vegetables, and you don't add salts, you're going to be fine. Um, if you just don't typically add a lot of salt and you take the salt shaker away, it's not going to change much. But now if you're going out three for three meals a day and getting all kinds of processed foods and you stop that and you start eating at home with no added salt, your, your blood pressure and your sodium level will drastically change. That will be a big difference. Um, so again, I just would get foods that don't have added salt. I would concentrate on lean proteins and fruits and vegetables. Um, and then the, uh, the last question that I have here is, should men with diagnosed heart disease attempt the use of testosterone supplements? Um, you need to check with your health care provider because it's more about maintaining healthy hormone levels. So you need to check your testosterone levels. Um, and it also goes along with your symptoms, too. Um, and when you get testosterone supplements, you should have your prostate checked, too. So there's a little bit more to it than, you know, should you take supplements. You just need to have healthy hormone values. So you need to have your hormone value checked. If you're going to take testosterone, you need to reassess the hormone levels. You need to follow with your health care provider. You need to have your prostate checked. So it's not necessarily whether you have heart disease or not. It, it's more about what your hormone, your testosterone levels are um, and what your symptoms are. Um, and thanks, everybody, for paying attention. Aaron, did you have more questions? We had one question come in in regards to calcium, and the question was, do you, do you yourself take a calcium supplement, and if so, which one do you take? Yeah, so I actually, um, I, I'm only taking, I only get about 500 milligrams from a calcium tablet, an over-the-counter calcium tablet, because I don't want that splurge of calcium to get in the artery and just come flourishing out in my body and not know what to do with it, and then I don't want to build up plaque in, in, my, in my heart arteries. So Because there was one small study that demonstrated that for women that were taking supplements. So since then, I've lowered it, and I've, then I've, taken, I've eaten foods that, to get about 400 to 600 milligrams of calcium a day. And it's difficult to do. And I come from a family, like I said, with um, poor bones. I think most of my family members on my maternal side 
have had hip replacements, joint replacements of, of some type. And so um, I am waiting, because I'm not one to nibble on bone, um, <laughs> but I am waiting for the kind of calcium alternative supplement to come out, because I think that's going to be great, because it's a natural way for us to get calcium. But I am, and then I will drop my supplement, and I will go to that, and then I will maintain the calcium and the food. Okay. Great. That's all the questions we have. Uh, Great job, Becky. Thank you very much. There will be a recording of this webinar available that will be emailed to you Friday or Monday. Uh, again, you can save 15% off on all your purchases today at Cardiotab.com. It's today only. Use the code uh, HEALTHYHEART15. Thank you again for attending, and we look forward to answering your health and nutrition questions again on our next webinar. Thank you.